Okay, let's talk about the beta-2 agonists. The beta-2 agonists ob obviously are uh, drugs that will uh, activate um, the beta-2 receptors. A gene um, encoding the beta-2 receptor is called ADRB2. I don't think it's important necessarily that you remember that unless you're going to really get into being an asthma therapist. But what we know about this gene is that at certain points of its genetic encoding, we can tell something about how well or not well the patient might respond to beta agonist therapy. So we know that if you're homozygous, remember homozygous means two of the same for our gene 16 at the 16 site. We know that if you're homozygous for arginine at 16, you're going to have a better response to beta-2 agonists than if you're homozygous glycine, I think that's what that is, at the 16 site, or if it's heterozygous for arginine and, and glycine. So homozygous arginine 16 will have, give you the better response to beta-2 agonists. We also know that that same homozygous arginine 16 patient or encoding will develop worsening lung function with continual use of beta agonists. So interestingly enough, it, you get a better response, but it seems to downregulate uh, more than the other genetic um, coding. We also know that if you're homozygous cysteine at the 19 position, you're going to have greater beta 2 receptor density. So you would have a better response again than if you're homozygous arginine at the 19 spot. And I think it's GLU glutamate. I should probably look that up. I don't remember. If you're glutamate at 27, you will resist downregulation and tolerance, therefore, better than uh, the arginine 16 and glycine at the 16 position. So glutamate 27 is, is good for resisting tolerance. We know that homozygous gazygous are genes at the 16 spot um, develops uh, resistance more quickly. So what does this all mean? Well, I think again, more and more, especially in your careers, we're going to know that the patient, for example, is um, homozygous arginine, which means they may respond okay, but they're going to develop tolerance more quickly than some of the other types. If we know that they're uh, glutamate 27, we know they're going to be we're going to be less concerned about overusing beta agonists. So there'll be less downregulation, so we can utilize this information to make better decisions about therapy. This jo shows another, I guess, evidence for different haplotypes um, that's used to code that beta 2 um, receptor region, um, and it shows you that we can predict, depending upon the type of haplotype pair that they have, how much they're going to respond as far as an improvement in their FEV1. As you can see, the best improvement is with the CRQ, CGQ um, grouping here. They have the best improvement in their FEV1. The weakest group is the CRQ, CRQ homozygous haplotype pair. All the others are vary. You can see this one's going to go from like an 8% improvement all the way almost to a 20% improvement. So we see quite a difference between the different haplotypes. So we would be able to predict how well a patient's going to respond to the beta agonists if we know this haplotype pair. Okay, so that's beta agonists. Corticosteroids, which is another important group of drugs uh, used to treat asthma, uh, corticosteroids decrease inflammation, as you know. Um, there are three different targets we're going to talk about as far as uh, the, gen the genomics of corticosteroid therapy for asthma. The NR3C1 Again, I don't expect you to memorize these, but it maps to a chromosomal, chromosomal region associated with asthma susceptibility. If they have the ASN363SER uh, 
genetic type, it's going to be more sensitive to exogenous glucocorroid therapy than other uh, genetic um, mapping. So this type is going to respond better to exogenous glucocorticoids than others. So it'd be nice to know that. If you ha at the ST1P1 site, there is a relative deficiency of endogenous glucocorticoid made, and therefore uh, it's more responsive again to uh, exogenous glucocorticoid. So both of these would give you a better response to corticosteroids than other uh, genetic encoding. This TBX21 histamine 33 uh, on the T cells is hyper responsive to inhaled glucocorticoids. So it's very responsive to these inhaled steroids. We could pro maybe give lesser doses. Oopsie. Now to the leukotriene modifiers. We already talked about the two different classes that we use. The, uh, and I want to just remind you with this little cascade. As you know, you can trigger an asthma attack with an allergen, exercise, cold air, etc., aspirin, um, that will then um, cause a mast cell to um, burst um, or eosinophils to be activated to make arachidonic acid. That arachidonic acid will then be broken down by 5 lipooxygenase to make the cystinal leukotrienes. Now, then the cystinal leukotrienes will be broken down uh, into, uh, or will activate the cystinal leukotriene in, uh, receptors. Those receptors will cause mucus secretion, plasma exudation, bronchoconstriction, and eosinophil recruitment to the area. So then, and that will lead to the asthma um, symptoms. We can use leukotriene inhibitors at two different points. The uh, five lipooxygenase inhibitors, like Zolutin, um, will block this cascade right here. The leukotriene antagonist will block this cascade right here because it's going to uh, interact here with the receptors, therefore blocking it kind of like a blind uh, blocker here to stop the cascade from happening here. Now these different, these are different genes that are responsible for the production of leukotrienes. This is AL oxygenase, lipooxygenase uh, 5, which encodes the protein for 5 lipooxygenase. Um, and then we have ALOX5AP, which is a 5 lipooxygenase activating protein. So this turns on the 5 lipooxygenase. Remember, we want to turn it off, don't we? Um, then uh, other genes that will affect leukotriene A4 and then will therefore um, affect the hydrolase, hyd hydrolase um, for leukotriene A4. And then also for leukotriene C4 synthetase, I'm sorry, synthase. And then the multi-resistance protein. And final, finally, the cystinal leukotriene 1 receptor can be affected by this particular gene. We're going to be most interested in this ALOX5 uh, gene. Those that are homozygous for the ALOX5 gene have a much lower response to zolutin because they're making more of that 5-LO than, um, and therefore overcoming the um, effect of zolutin. This, patients that are homozygous for this ALOX5 is, it's only about 3% of the population, but that's still 3 out of 100. That starts to add up when you look at large populations. We're also interested in the leukotriene C4S, which will, again, make leukotriene C4 synthase, which is a uh, leukotriene uh, receptor. 
The C allele is better than the A allele for leukotriene re uh, receptor antagonists. So the C allele is better than the A um, as far as response. Some more genetic effects on response for the leukotriene. Um, this, is a, this is the response to zolutin, and this is the FEV1 change from baseline. So we want this to be as high as possible. We want this to be increased. On day eight, we see the wild type um, to have the best response on day eight as compared to the wild type um, given placebo. This is a wild type with zolutin wild type with placebo and then this last one is a, the mutant type with the zolutin so it actually hurts the FEV1 if they have the mutant type um, the mutation uh, for uh, zolutin day 84 it's even more distinct you can see there's a, a big increase if you have the wild type of receptor Again, with placebo, you still see an increase, but it's not as much. But if you give the drug to the, with the mutant receptor, you see, again, a decrease in FEV1. One more genetic effect of response on the, um, on the leukotriene inhibitor, Montulacast. If you give uh, Montulacast 10 milligrams for six months, we can see again the FEV1 increases most with um, this type of genotype, a GG for the ALOX5. It's significantly decreased for the GA or the so this is the this is the um, homozygous for GG and this is heterozygous and then homozygous A we can see has the poorest response. If we look at the multi-resistance protein. Uh, a receptor we can see again that the homozygous for C has a much lower response than the uh, heterozygous um, genotype okay let's just finish this out quickly zolutin as we know which is the five ox the five um, I forgot the name of the enzyme I don't know Five lipooxygenase inhibitor. There you go. Um, is a racemic mixture, which means it's uh, got 50/50 of uh, the co compound that's arranged to rotate polarized light to the right, and 50% that will rotate polarized light to the left. It's cleared hepatically, and is a substrate for the sip, several different SIP enzymes, which all could have possible genetic alteration. So what we've been talking about before now are effects on the receptors. This is effects on the kinetics uh, and specifically on the enzymes that clear, the, clear this drug, zolutin. So 1A2 has possible genetic alteration, 2C9 and 3A4, which isn't very common, but 1A2 and 2C9, you can see genetic alteration. It's also 93% bound to plasma protein, so binding is going to matter and its bioavailability is about 75%. The leukotriene receptor antagonists are also racemic mixtures, um, and they need substrates for transport. So they use peak like a protein and other things to be transported across membranes because they're so large. Their substrate for 3A4 and 2C9, again, which can be genetically altered. Bioavailability is, much, bioavailability is a little bit lower at 64%, and they're very highly protein bound. They're also cleared hepatically, as we've said before, with the substrate uh, 3A4 and 2C9, um, and they're also excreted in the bile. All right, next time we're going to talk about the alpha. Thank you. Bye.